You know, um, I was thinking this week uh, about what I was going to uh, speak on, and, and it occurred to me that many of us belong to a lot of things or a lot of people. I mean, think about it, with our families, right? I belong to my wife, my children, my brother and sister, my aunts and uncles, and all those folks, okay? Um, when I was little, I'm thinking about all these organizations that I belong to. When I was a kid, I played Little League, right? I belonged to Little League teams. I belonged to soccer teams and football teams and basketball teams, did all that stuff. Um, when I was in elementary school, I belonged to the Del Cerro Elementary Choir. <laughs> Bet you didn't know that. And the Del Cerro Elementary uh, flag football team. I belonged to the YMCA Indian Guides. Have you ever heard of the Indian Guides? Back in the day, right? So like dads and their, and their little, little sons, we'd all be in a tribe together and do stuff together. And we all had to take like tribal names. My dad was Big Star. I was Little Star, okay? So uh, that was kind of fun. Belo belong I, I belong to the Boy Scouts, okay, and an Eagle Scout Association. I belong to Community Christian Church of San Juan Capistrano. That was my home church, small little church uh, right across the street from the San Juan Mission down in uh, Southern California where the swallows would return, if you remember. I was a member of the Ralph's Grocery Store Company. <laughs> A proud box boy for six years. <laughs> I remember my phrase, ma'am, would you like paper or plastic? <laughs> that was it, that was it. Um, I was a member of the golf teams and the baseball teams at Mission Viejo High School. I was a member of the Adelphoi Fraternity and the Student Council at uh, Pacific Christian College where I got my BA. Um, I belonged to uh, different honor societies. I belonged on the staff at uh, many different churches and Christian camps. But of course, my favorite has been Calvary Community Church of Manton. <laughs> Love belonging and being a part of the family here at Calvary. Probably most important, I am a member of AAA. So I, I belong to AAA, all right? I belong to AAA. <laughs> but, but if you think about it, uh, out of all these different uh, organizations or people that we belong to, there's nothing more important than belonging as a child in the family of God the Father through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, filled with his Holy Spirit. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. And that's where we're going to start this morning. If you have your programs, uh, please follow along in the sermon notes. Um, we belong to God, but there's an if clause. The if is, if his spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. Now, this morning we're going to look at Romans chapter 8. Last week we looked at Romans chapter 7, and that was a tough ride. Romans chapter 7 was all about the battle of sin within us. Um, and yet now we get to Romans chapter 8, and... And we learn about the victory that we have over sin as believers through the power and indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. So that's where we're going to go. We're going to talk about the difference that the Holy Spirit can make in our lives. But before we do, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us into your house this morning, Lord. Um, your Holy Spirit is amongst us uh, We've had a chance to greet each other in, in godly Christian fellowship, and that's not something we take lightly. We are a family here in your family. We are truly brothers and sisters in our common faith in our Lord Jesus. And, and we thank you for the time where we've been able to lift up your name and worship you. And now we, we thank you for the time where we can open your word and allow you to speak to us. Speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, speak to our hands and feet, that we would continue to grow day by day in the people that you've created us to be, that we wouldn't be the same people that we were last week, <laughs> that we would be making uh, steps of progress, Father, in, in becoming more like your son, Jesus. 
So I pray your blessing and power upon this time that we have this morning. In your son Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 All right. Well, to begin, uh, as we look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 17, I want to share with you three truths that we can embrace. Three truths that we can embrace. Embrace. Now remember, back in, in chapter 7, the apostle Paul was, was being personal, and uh, he uh, was talking about this battle that went on uh, inside of him, uh, the battle of the flesh and the battle of the spirit. And you remember he said, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, that's what I do, right? That's why a lot of people thought the apostle Paul was a golfer. Very common experience, Okay. <laughs> But, but it's pretty serious battle there. And, and he gets to the end of, of sharing this, and he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I'm in this physical body with its weaknesses, and it causes me to disobey God. Who will deliver me from this? And then he says, Thanks be to God for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? Just like in Sunday school, Jesus is the answer, okay? Jesus is the answer. And, and so um, then he gets into chapter 8, and chapter 8 is a lot of good news. And the first truth that we are to embrace that's good news is this, that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have God's Holy Spirit, you are eternally secure. Eternally secure. Now, Paul says in Romans 8, Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Even when I sin, even when we sin, there is no eternal condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, let's define our terms. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It means that we are justified, we are saved, we are legally considered not guilty before God because of our sin um, by our true faith in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. True faith. In the gospel, what's the gospel? The good news about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We put our, our, our trust, our faith in, in what Jesus did, his finished work on the cross. Not our good works, not anything we can earn. We do that and we receive God's Holy Spirit. And that means that our salvation is eternally secure. What does condemnation mean? It tells us there's therefore now no condemnation uh, for those of us in Christ. Well, the word condemnation was a sentence of spiritual death and a punishment that our sins uh, deserved. And yet Jesus paid for that on the cross so that when we put our faith in Jesus, we won't be condemned for an eternity separated from God, Jesus himself put it this way. And uh, anytime Jesus says something, it's good to pay attention, all right? In, in John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus uh, said, Truly, truly, I say to you. Now remember, when Jesus says truly, truly, that means it's really, really important, okay? So, truly, truly, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever hears my word, okay? And you believe in my Father, him who sent me, you believe that I am the Son of God, that I am here to bring life and that you might have it abundantly, that I will sacrifice myself for your sins. You, you believe my word. You believe in the one who sent me and you will have eternal life. Period. Done deal. You will receive eternal life. For he has not come into judgment or condemnation, but has passed from death to life. Church, all of us that have put our faith in Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and have truly meant it sincerely, we have spiritually passed from death, eternal death, to eternal life. And that's good news, church. That's awesome news. 
That is awesome news. And in that truth, we are eternally secure. Okay? Uh, we, we might walk away for a while. In a season of, in our life, Christians will do that. But God will always bring us back. He will always bring us back when we are his true children. The second truth to embrace is that we are internally free. We're internally free. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2, Paul goes on and he says, For the law of the Spirit, or the principle of life in the Holy Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin, which leads to to death. We have the Holy Spirit. Uh, That's our guarantee. We're going to heaven. Our sins are forgiven, and the Holy Spirit also empowers us to say no to sin and temptation and live the life that that the Lord has has given to us. Um, It means that we are free from the control of sin, that Jesus has set us free. Notice that's past tense. It's done. You know, uh, here at Calvary, we have uh, a philosophy that you can come as you are, all right? You can dress, in other words, however you want. Our youth pastor exemplified that very well this morning, as you saw. I don't know if he's in the room, but I'm not above embarrassing him publicly. He knows I love him. You can dress however you want, all right? So... He's got his vibe. Our drummer here is dressed like he's ready to go to a Giants game. You know, you can, you can show up however you want, okay? Um, you can be in a, in a jacket and tie. You can be in shorts, T-shirts, whatever. I remember um, one time this guy uh, showed up, and, um, and, and I saw him come into the parking lot. because He was, he was, he was uh, driving a Harley, and those things are loud, you know? <laughs> you know when it's a Harley, right? So he, he parks his motorcycle, and he gets out, and he comes walking in. He's got this leather jacket on. I'm all, okay, we got a biker coming. Praise the Lord, all right? <laughs> so he walks up, and I put my hand out. Hi, I'm Pastor Jim. And... Um, he had a big smile on his face, and I didn't even know the guy. He just grabs me in a bear hug, right? <laughs> I'm all, well, hi. Um, and he goes, hey, pastor, and he told me his name. And I, and I, and I was looking at his jacket, and I said, hey, uh, I noticed on the back of your jacket that says set free. What's that? He goes, you know what? And he started to share with me his testimony a little bit. He said, man, I used to be in all kinds of biker gangs, and I was not a nice person. Um, we, we sold drugs, and we had little kids on the streets selling our drugs, and we took advantage of people. We stole from people. We beat people up. You know, I've been in and out of prison, but I found my salvation in Jesus Christ. He said, and Jesus has set me free. That's why it's on my jacket. I am set free. And I said, that is awesome. And he looked at me, and he said, and you know what, Pastor? I said, what? He said, and I'm not looking back. I'm not looking back, okay? Truths to embrace of the Holy Spirit. We're eternally secure. We're internally free. Number three, we are positionally righteous. Now, why do I say positionally? You looked at yourself every day? <laughs> I look at myself. We're not always righteous, 100%, right, in our thoughts in our words, in our attitudes, in our actions every day. We'll mess up, we'll sin, but those sins were covered on the cross when we put our faith in Jesus. Positionally, big picture, we are righteous before God because we have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter eight, verses three to four, it says this, for God has done what the law, the Old Testament law, weakened by the flesh, because nobody could obey it, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. It was first fulfilled in Jesus because he was completely righteous. And he was able to take our place on the cross and bear our sins so that we might be forgiven. And then when we put our faith in Jesus, his righteousness mysteriously, miraculously 
biblically is transferred to our account. The righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us who walk, who live our lives, not according to the flesh, our sinful ways or nature, but according to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, okay? So what's our job? Our job is to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, right? Uh, You know, our, our spiritual lives are a lot like gardening, you ever think about that? Gardening. Now, we've had a lot of rain lately, and I look out in my backyard, and I have weeds growing like this high, okay? I got weeds everywhere. I've got weeds that are bigger than my bushes, okay? I have weeds bigger than my flowers in my backyard, okay? The weeds have just, they've, they've taken over. Here's the thing. I didn't do anything. I didn't add fertilizer to grow weeds in my backyard. I didn't do that. The weeds just came up on their own, okay? They just came up on their own. But I I need to tend my yard if I want healthy plants and vegetables and flowers. I got to pull the weeds out, right? I have to tend the garden. It's the same thing with our spiritual lives. We have this fleshly sin nature within us, and if we don't address the spiritual, the Holy Spirit within us, guess what's going to start growing? Weeds. Weeds of the flesh. They will grow naturally. Amen, church? They will. You'll say something, you'll think, where did that come from? You'll think something, where did that come from? You'll do something, I can't believe I just did that. They're weeds. Because you haven't been in God's word. You haven't been in prayer. You haven't been in church. Shame on y'all. But that's what happens, right? And the weeds start growing in our spiritual lives. Our job is to walk according to the Spirit and to allow God's Holy Spirit within us grow Um, through his word, through prayer, through Christian fellowship through worshiping together and all those, all those things. Now, what difference does the Holy Spirit make? Well, there are truths to embrace. Secondly, there are choices to make. There are choices to make. You know, uh, we make choices all the time that identify us, the way that we want to be identified uh, with or as. Um, In our society today, um, it's become very popular to identify yourself by your gender. And you can choose whatever gender you'd like and whatever accompanying pronouns, okay? And that's kind of crazy, all right? I didn't have that struggle when I was in high school. Or for others, you know, they want to be identified by the color of their skin, and that's a big deal, or their ethnicity or background, or their economic status, or their educational status, or their athletic status, or, you know, you name it, right? Fill in the blank. This is who I am, right? This is how I want to identify myself. Let me put this on the screen. With God, there's only two choices how you can identify yourself. The most important choice of personal identification from God's point of view, am I in the flesh or am I in the spirit? Am I in the flesh? All right. Doing my own thing. Uh, Rejecting God in my life. Neglecting God. Even being hostile towards God. That's the flesh. Or am I going to humble myself, submit myself, receive his love, his grace, his mercy, trust his son Jesus as my savior, receive his spirit, and walk in the spirit. Those are the two choices we get in the eyes of God. And Paul describes what it is Um, for those who choose to live a life in the flesh, in verses 5 to 8. I would say that these are people who are not saved. In Romans 8, 5 to 8, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's their bent. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In high school, um, had a group of friends, and I had grown up with these guys since we were in elementary school, like kindergarten, first, second grade, right? We had a little posse, about 10 of us, okay? We were buddies, right? And you might remember your kids, and if, you've, if you stayed in the same house for a while, we stayed in the same neighborhood, and we went all the way up through elementary school, junior high, and then high school. And when we were in elementary school, man, it was all about Little League and soccer and, and uh, going to the parks and playing flag football and hide-and-go-seek and you know, whatever we did, right? We just had a great time. We were just in our childhood, pretty innocent, having sleepovers at each other's houses, stuff like that, right? Um, then we're in the, the awkward junior high period where we didn't know who we were or what was going on. And then when we got into high school, a lot of my friends, they started partying. And um, now on the weekends, it was about, hey, let's see if we can, you know, get an older brother or somebody to get us some cases of beer. Um, let's go see if we can score some weed, and uh, let's uh, find a place where we can get drunk and get high, right? And um, look at pornography and stuff like that. And this was going on in my high school years. And, you know, I was a Christian, right? And, and I was pretty much the only one. And all these guys were like, what's the matter with you, Jim? You know, I'm like, you know, I was trying to fit in. I'd known these guys forever, right? They were like brothers to me. It's like, guys... It was really hard for me at, at that stage of my life to be able to explain to them the battle that was going on inside of me. You know, I, I had the spirit. Once in a while, I'd participate in that stuff. Well, I never smoke weed. But um, I want to make that clear, okay? <laughs> Even though it's legal. Anyway, but uh, back then it wasn't. Um, you know, I, I was trying to walk in the spirit as best I could, okay? These guys weren't. They didn't have the Lord. I tried to invite them to youth group and church. They wouldn't come. They were hostile to God. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't obey God if they wanted to. They didn't have the spirit, see? And that's what Paul's talking about here. Um, as a believer, it's a good question to ask. Am I giving the Holy, the Holy Spirit control of, of my mind? The bent of my life, in my attitudes, my actions, my decisions, my choices, my desires, my motives, my beliefs. Am I standing strong? Now, as he continues in, in Romans 8, verse 9, he says, Now you, however, remember he's talking to these Roman believers. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. All right? You, you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've put away those pagan idol gods or trying to please God through obeying the Old Testament laws. You're, you're not in the flesh anymore. You're in the Spirit. And then he, he puts in a qualifier, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. He wanted them to think about it. Paul didn't know them personally. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. In you, anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ doesn't belong to him. But if you have the Spirit, we can know for sure that we belong to, to God, okay? He didn't want to discourage them, but he wanted to have them reflect on where they were at. He goes on in Romans 8, verse 10, he says, But if Christ is in you through the Holy Spirit, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit... Uh, is life because of righteousness. In other words, our physical bodies are going to die, but we have the Holy Spirit within us because of the righteousness of Jesus. Okay? He goes on in verse 11, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's God. If the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in you, the God who raised His Son Jesus from the dead... He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Holy Spirit who dwells in you. You know, a lot of us don't like our bodies, do we? Now, I'm not looking for personal confession time here, all right? 
But, you know, we've all got these thoughts, right? Oh, gee, I'm, uh, you know, I got freckles and I can't ever do anything with my hair and my ears are lopsided and my nose is out of whack and a little overweight or a little too thin. And, you know, we can go on with our list, right? I can't see, okay? Or for some, more seriously, you know, I'm sick. I have a disease. Um, here's the good news. <laughs> We're not taking these bodies with us. When we die, these bodies will be done. And we will be raised with transformed bodies, with spiritual bodies, with incorruptible, eternal bodies made for a new heaven and earth, church. That's good news. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And don't worry about your body now. You're going to like your body in heaven, okay? I don't know really what they're going to be like, but you're going to like it, okay? Because it's heaven. God's not going to have you exist for an eternity with him in heaven with a body you don't like. You know, you walk around. Hey, Jesus, can you do something about this? Uh, you know, isn't this supposed to be heaven, you know? I don't know what our bodies are going to be like, but man, they're going to be different, okay? And that's good news. God is going to raise us up and resurrect our, our bodies. Then Paul goes on in, in, in Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. He kind of wraps it up. He says, okay, so then, brothers and sisters, we're debtors, or we have an obligation, but not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Uh, for if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So he's, he's wrapping it up. He's saying, listen, put away the flesh, okay? Live in the Spirit. It's like that story probably a lot of you have heard, but um, two older gentlemen were sitting around one day, and they were talking, and uh, one of the guys, um, he'd become a Christian about six months prior, and uh, he was uh, from an American Indian uh, tradition, and um, he said, uh, he's telling his buddy, uh, I don't know if I told you, but I became a Christian, you know, about a half a year ago, really, what's that like? He says, well, I don't know yet. It's really good on the one hand, but I feel, like, I feel like there's two dogs inside of me that are fighting. Two dogs? What are you talking about? He says, well, there's, there's this one dog, you know, and, uh, and it's a good dog. And it, it, it influences me to be kind to other people, uh, to love my family, to, to work hard, to, um, to be generous in giving with other people. You know, to love others, to want to pray and study God's word and, and worship. And then there's, but there's this other dog inside of me. And these two dogs, they're fighting all the time. What's that dog like? Well, that dog, that dog's kind of mean. That dog influences me to be, you know, in a bad mood and mean. And, and I say things that I shouldn't say, mean things. And I, uh, and I have bad attitudes and, and disobedient type of actions. I said, what's that like? And he says, well, these two dogs, it just seems that they're fighting within me all the time. His buddy's looking at him like, wow. Well, which dog wins the fight? <laughs> the old man thought about it. And he says, the one that I feed. The one that I feed. Spiritually, right? We feed the spirit and we'll starve the flesh. If we feed ourselves on God's word, if we feed our spirits in prayer, if we feed our spirits in worship, if we feed our spirits in Christian fellowship, if we feed our spirits in ministry and service, if we feed our spirits in loving our neighbors as ourselves, if we feed our spirits and not only looking out for our own interests, but the interests of others, we're going to starve the flesh. We're going to starve that other dog, and we should start our, starve that other dog. We want to kill that other dog, all right? We want that dog dead. No more Alpo for you, buddy, okay? You're done. You're done. 
So that, that's a message for we believers. So what is the Holy Spirit? What's the difference the Spirit makes in our lives? Finally, there are benefits to receive. There's a lot of benefits to receive. Having the Holy Spirit dwell within us. So now Paul turns to all the positives. And the first is that we are not only indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but we are led by the Holy Spirit. All right? That can influence our lives. So Paul says in Romans 8, 14, for all who are led by the Spirit uh, of God are sons of God. Now the question might be, okay, pastor, but how do I know that I am being led by the Spirit? Let's look at a couple things. Let's look at truth. Uh, do you believe that truth is relative? Or do you believe in absolute truth? See, our society would believe and teach in our universities and colleges what's called uh, relative truth. In other words, whatever is true for you is okay. You know, right? Follow your own truth. Whatever is, is good for you, that is okay. And whatever is good for you, that might be different there, but that's okay. That's your truth. Find your own truth because truth is relative. And so what we get from that is a lot of uh, messed up pathways in life and a lot of people who are not living their lives according to the designer of life, the creator of life, God the Father. But if, if you believe in absolute truth, then you would believe that we worship and serve an absolute God. And he has shared with us his absolute truth through his word and principles to live by. So that's, and if you follow these principles, then you will be led by God's Holy Spirit. That's why we preach God's word each and every week. That's why one of our values here at Calvary is over here on the wall, we open the book. We open the book on Sunday mornings. We open the book in our life groups. We open the book in our youth and children and wherever. This is where God speaks to us, his authority. Um, gee, am I led by the Holy Spirit? What about my character? Um, are my actions, my attitudes being influenced by the culture or the creator? Think about that. There's a lot of churches who are caving into the culture right now. If I'm led by the Spirit, I am going to seek to obey God's word. I'm going to be a person who forgives others. I am going to strive to heal damaged relationships in my life. I am going to make godly decisions. I'm going to pray for others and serve. I'm going to give generously of my time, my talents, and my treasures. I'm going to share my faith with others. I'm not going to show up next week by myself. Who said that? I'm going to bring a friend. Somebody I know to hear the good news. And I'm going to live with attitudes of joy and peace and hope and love. I've heard those before, the fruit of the Spirit, right? That's how we know. And that's a benefit to be led by the Spirit. Second benefit is we are adopted as God's sons and daughters. Paul uses that word <coughs> adoption about four or five times in his writings. To be adopted by God, that's a permanent thing. That's not something that God does uh, on multiple occasions. Well, I'll adopt you now because you're being good. And when you're being bad, I will unadopt you. When you get your act together, then I might adopt you back again into my family. It doesn't work that way. Okay? It's a one-time thing. And it's a huge benefit to be adopted into the family of God. And so the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 15 to 16, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, 
by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's awesome news. Um, that word adopted carries with it the idea of ownership. God owns us through his Holy Spirit. Um, we're his sons, we're his daughters. It's not, our relationship with God is not God and human, okay? Our relationship with God is father and son, father and daughter. And we can call him with the same intimate term that Jesus used with his heavenly father. We can too, when we pray, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Translation of that is daddy. You know, my children, uh, when I enter a room and they're there, I haven't seen them in a while, they don't say, greetings, Father. <laughs> it's been a while, Pastor Jim. Nice to see you. No. It's like, Dad. We hug each other. Dad. When they were bummed out, when they were going through hard times, they're like, Daddy, help me. <laughs> they usually need money. But Daddy, help me. <laughs> right? And that's okay. God invites us to call him Abba. Abba. Daddy. Because we're his adopted kids. The final benefit is this. We are heirs awaiting our eternal inheritance. No longer slaves of sin. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 17, and if we're children, if we're adopted, by God the Father, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified for eternity, transformed anew with him. <clears throat> We're in the family of God. We might need to suffer as Christ suffered, as we go through this life being disciples of the Lord, but ultimately we will receive our inheritance, our heavenly inheritance in glory. You might be saying, is that true, pastor? I want you to leave with this. Can I, can I really have assurance of my salvation? Can I really walk out of here today knowing for sure 100% that I'm going to heaven, that I'm saved? I've been at this a long time, Pastor, and there have been times of doubt where I haven't been sure. Really? Let me read you something out of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says this in Ephesians 1, 13. In him, in Jesus Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. That's God's stamp of ownership upon your life, the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee, guarantee of our what? Of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Isn't that good news, church? That's good news.